Hey everybody, Scott Weichel. You're listening to My Kind of Country right here on Fish Creek Radio with our very special tribute to the great Lefty Frizzell. I don't think I could have done this uh, show properly without having this gentleman on with me tonight because uh, I think of, of anybody, he has uh, carried on the legacy of Lefty Frizzell both in the music and also in, in books and uh, he's written a screenplay about Lefty's life and uh, he remains very active in preserving the legacy of Lefty Frizzell. And uh, there's few that knew him better, and I'm very happy to have him with us to talk about some great memories of Lefty tonight. This is my good friend, David Frizzell. David, how are you tonight? Scott, it is great to be with you, and you're talking about a subject that has been the top front of my subject matter here for the last, as long as I can remember, uh, the great Lefty Frizzell. And, and uh, you're right about I wrote I wrote a, a memoir of Lefty, and all my memories have been with him throughout my lifetime, and the especially during the times when I was on the road with him and working with him and uh, and just being with him day after day, night after night for just years and years. And he was just, he was just, I really would like for people to know how it was to kind of be around Lefty. It was not an, it was not an ordinary day, I can tell you. <laughs> he was a great man. Oh, absolutely. You know, I've, I've heard so many great stories with the other folks that have been on the show and, uh, you know, some of the things I really picked up with Lefty, he was he was quite a practical joker, and he always loved to get a rise out of somebody to see what kind of a reaction he could get. You know, he would go out of his way. <laughs> <laughs> he, would, he would actually go out of his way to to do a practical joke on you or something. I, I, you know, he used to go to those, I guess he'd go, once he'd have a little time, and he'd be out on the road someplace, and he'd go to some of them joke stores, you know, where you pick up his different little type of jokes and stuff, you know. And then he'd come by the house and come by when I was a kid, he'd come by and he'd play all them jokes on his kids, on his brothers and sisters. I remember one time it was in Beaumont, Texas where he lived and and uh, and I'd been out in the car. We drove there and I was still asleep when I woke up. Everybody else was in the house. And so I got up and I went in and I still was about half groggy from being asleep in, in that car all night driving to Beaumont. And, uh, and so I sat down in the chair there. He said, hey, David, he said, here, while you're just sitting there, he said, look at this book. So he had me this little book, about a five by seven little book, and opened it up and it's full of batteries. <laughs> it just shot me away. You know what I mean? <laughs> I threw that book clear across the room. But, uh, but he just got such a kick out of just, out of just stuff like that. And uh, I remember my sister was doing the dishes. My older sister was doing the dishes. And he walked up behind her and gave her a big old hug, patted her on the back. Pretty soon she, he walked away. Pretty soon she started itching all over. She had put itch powder <laughs> all, <laughs> all over her neck and back. Oh, my gosh. So, no, he just, he just always always was into some kind of a, a practical joke. And laughing was his thing, man. He, he got such a, a great kick out of being around people and and making them laugh and uh, making up stories and making up uh, just you know making up stuff that he matter of fact he'd, he'd write plays in his head at the time he was we was doing it he'd make them up as it was going along he'd give everybody a part and, and, and he was just he just liked to get everybody involved in everything he was doing and he was so good at it and it was always so much fun having left you at the house. Well, I'll tell you, I, from talking to you guys over the years, I've, uh, I think that's kind of a family trait. It seems like you all love to laugh and you have a great time. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. And it wasn't just to us family. It was to, to you know, everybody in you. Uh, I'm, you know, just from Roger Miller to Merle Haggard to just everybody, he played little jokes on them and, and always had them laughing about something and always something, always something. <laughs> and uh, so it was always just a real good time being around him. And I remember many, many times I, I worked with him. I was hoping to show and, and make sure that he was at the shows and make sure the guitars were in tune and that sort of stuff. But from 1956, I guess the kid, 1956 to 1960, I was with him opening the shows. And that's when I first met, oh gosh, all the people that was George Jones, Berlin Husky, Johnny Cash, uh, you know, ever and uh, June Carr, and just you know, just everybody that was in the country music business at that time, and uh, and grew up around them and knew them for the rest of their life or uh, the rest of mine, you know. 
but he was uh, he was the one that, that made it all happen for me. But not only me, but uh, there was a lot of people. If you if you ask them, what do you think of Lefty? Well, he was the greatest song stylist that I've ever heard. And man, when his song come on the on the on the radio, I pull the car off the road so I could just sit and listen to it. <laughs> and uh, very few times that's happened to me, but uh, but it happened uh, with. Uh, with, with Lefty when I hear him, or George Jones when he stopped loving her today. I heard that on the radio. I actually had to pull off the highway. Oh, yeah. I pulled off the highway so I could hear it. <laughs> but there's just a few, a very few of those that you can remember that you went to that kind of extreme to, to be able to hear the song, you know, and concentrate on hearing the song. You're absolutely right. <laughs> well, you, uh, <clears throat> I was reading in, your, uh, in the book, and this the book is called I Love You a Thousand Ways. It's Lefty Frizzell's yeah. story, folks. And, and you can go to davidfrizzell.com. The book is available there, and you also have a, a CD set, an audio set uh, for the book as well on there. And, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Everything, everything that's in that yeah. book is on those uh, CDs, I guess they are. Well, I was I was reading a part on there, and I wanted to ask you a little more about this. Um, uh, Lefty and, and did a tour with Hank Williams, and you had a little section in there. You were talking about the, them swapping songs. Lefty and Hank did a six day tour uh, throughout uh, uh, Arkansas and Louisiana, and uh, and so while they were out there, they became even better friends than they were before. And and one of the last days they were together was after the tour was over and they was getting ready to go their separate ways. They had, they were they had locked themselves in a in a motel room and was switching songs back and was listening to songs, trying to write some songs. And Hank Williams, I think, came up with the idea of hey, hey let's let's uh, let's just each write a song and, and give it to each other and but let's not tell anybody who who, who wrote what. And then, then let's just see what happens, right? <laughs> Well, from what I understand, both songs went high on the charts, probably even as high as number one on the Billboard charts. And neither one of them would ever tell you who wrote what. No kidding. But but over the years, I kind of thought I knew, and and uh, and uh, Jeff Williams thought that she knew, but we don't really know. You know, there's no way of really ever knowing. Well, what's, what, uh, what's your what's your best guess? Well, I, let me think back on it again. I thought I had it one time. <laughs> I, 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 well, one time I thought it was a bug has got a hold in it. But then I realized that that song was written before uh, Lefty knew Hank. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, but I like to think about it now because I, I haven't had that on my mind in quite a while. So I, I have to go back through the songs again and try to remember what was out at that time. Uh, but uh, that, that really did happen. As a matter of fact, they uh, they left that the motel. They went to the airport. Well, they, they were taken to the airport, and I think it was uh, in Louisiana and uh, uh, Shreveport, I believe. <laughs> anyway, Lefty flew back up to Dallas, where his wife Alice picked him up at the airport, and Hank flew back to Nashville. It was only after he flew back to Nashville that they realized. That Hank had left his car at the motel. Oh, jeez! <laughs> in Shreveport. So it just gets crazy. Those guys are, you know, what was what was so different between them and the people of today is that they were making it up as they go. There was nobody before them uh, that they could say, "Oh, well, we're doing something like whoever else," you know. No, there was nobody else. There wasn't anybody else. Yeah. Bob Wills was out there being just crazy as he could be. And uh, and Lefty and Hank were, were right along with him. So that was a time in country music when when you you, you didn't make any you didn't you wasn't in, you you didn't do like anybody else because you was making it up as you go because there was nobody before you. That's right. Now we can say, oh man, you're you're doing what Lefty did. <laughs> oh well, I'm, hey, I'm doing what what I heard that Hank did. You know, but well, you those know, days they weren't able to do that, so they'd make it up as they go. They set the standards that we that we uh, we abide by today, and it was pretty low. I was trying to raise my standards right. <laughs> throughout the years. But anyway, we had more fun with those guys than you can even imagine. And they taught us simply everything. And uh, Lefty, every day, of, every day that I remember being around him when I first came to work with him and, and way back in the early days 
when he'd come by when we were living as a family when we were just growing up, he'd come by and maybe pick me up for the weekend and take me to one of his dates, drop me back off at the mom and dad's house on the way back when the shows were over. And all that time he'd tell me, he said, now David, he said, you're, you're learning everything, you're, you're getting to see everybody, you're getting, you know, you, he said, but somewhere in all of this, you got to find yourself and all. you got to find David for self. We don't need another Hank Williams. We don't need another Lefty. We don't need another George Jones. We need another. We need a David Frizzell. So you've got to be David. You've got to be David. And I heard that, oh, my goodness gracious, almost like like all the time. And I remember one one uh, one day, one morning in uh, Northridge, California, where he lived uh, in California back in the 50s, um, I was sitting in the in the uh, den, and I was just playing the guitar about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I was just sitting there either trying to make up a song or just singing something. And he walked by, and, and he's on the way to the kitchen, and he walked by, and he stopped. And I looked up at him, and he looked down at me, and he said, you got to be David. Remember, <laughs> you've got to find David and all this. Then he just walked in the kitchen, right? <laughs> and about 15 minutes, he came back, by, and he stopped again. And he looked down at me, and I looked up, and he said, we don't need another Bob Dylan either. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask about Curly Chalker, and if I'm not mistaken, I, th I think he's responsible for coming out. You know, every, every every big star at that day had their own signature lick. You know, it was like Ernest Tubb right. had the guitar lick. You, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, God, yeah. And, uh, you don't hear that anymore. Isn't that a crazy? No. Other than Merle. Other than Merle, yeah. Owens had kind of, had kind of his, own, uh, his own sound, you know. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but the, uh, Don. the, the uh, intro for Always Late. Is I, oh, yeah. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was the first time that that Lefty Frizzell signature lick was used in one of his songs. Is that right? You know what? They, uh, back in those days, um, the signature licks were kind of in, and uh, and of course you don't hear them anymore today. And and I still like them. I still like them. I, I like Merle Haggard. Man, you could tell it was going to be Merle at the first. There, there, you right at the first. But that's going to be Merle singing here in a second. <laughs> And I, and I love that. I still like it, but somehow or other, the business has gotten away from it. And uh, and and I I still like the signature lick. But you're right about the always lick. It had that steel guitar lick. <clears throat> and I tell you what, you know, we lost Merle Haggard this last year, and and uh, uh, and he just he just ah, goodness gracious, what what else can you say about Merle Haggard? Said he was just the most incredible. Yeah, but it wasn't just. It wasn't just there again. It wasn't just his great, incredible singing, or his in, the best in the world writing. But it was also the way he walked into a room, or, or the way he'd, he'd say hello to you, yeah. or I, you know, or it, it was just him. And uh, and and uh, but he was. But not long ago, we did a tribute to Merle on RFD television, and uh, and I they were asking me to sing a song on there and. And I chose a particular song called That's the Way It Was in 51. Yeah. And because there was a story behind that song that I wanted to tell the story of me and Merle because of, because of that song. And so I sang the song on that show. And it was so neat when we got to the, to the <laughs> so, so incredible. Some of the best players in the world we have in Nashville, you know, right now. And we always have that, you know, basically. Um, but uh, we got to the show. It was rehearsing the show like the day before we actually uh, filmed the show, and uh, and so I was getting ready to do to just rehearse with the band. Uh, that's the way it was in '51. And we got. <clears throat> I walked up there, and the steel guitar player, Mike Johnson, great steel guitar player, mm -hmm. one of my favorite steel guitar players I've ever heard, Mike Johnson. And he and he said, "Oh, David." He said, "I got." I, he said, "I got a special thing uh, that I'll uh, for the ending of this song." He said, well, I'll, "I'll just show it to you when we get there." I said, "Okay." So we went through the song, and on the very end, he played the opening of "Always Late." I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying? on the steel, and he looked at me, at me with that incredible smile he's got, and I said, 
that's the way it's supposed to be, but <laughs> that's the way it needs to be. Yep. So when we actually film the show, uh, film my song on that show, if you get a chance to watch me singing, uh, that's the way it was in 51, listen to the very end. Yeah. Mike Johnson yeah. plays. I saw it. it you're right. Always late. I loved it. I loved it. I thought that was just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Merle would have loved that. Oh, you Merle know he would have loved that. You know he would. I mean, he just he just would. He probably uh, would, he probably would have put it on the record if he had thought of it back then. <laughs> if he had thought of it, he probably would have. He was just he was just an amazing man. But you know what? I've been a very fortunate uh, fellow in my lifetime that I've been around folks like him. And, and Brother Lefty and Johnny Cash and Marty Robbins, for heaven's sake. Oh, my God. Uh, Conway Quitty. Come on, it just goes on and on. I knew all these guys. It shows with all these guys throughout my, my life. And, and uh, I've had some pretty good shows, but they were they were great when they were there. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they, were, they were pretty good shows, and then there were times when I was with these guys. You know? <laughs> oh, man. Unbelievable. Well, tell me a little bit about Jack Starnes. As I was reading, um, Jack Starnes, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was one of the co-founders of Starday Records, which was George Jones' first label. And uh, I was reading in the book that uh, he uh, did, did a lot of uh, work uh, for Lefty uh, before that happened, too. Well, he really did. And um, the fellow by the name of Jim Beck was uh, the one who, who had the studio in Dallas that Lefty went uh, and to just do some demos. And when he went into that studio uh, in Dallas with some musicians, he did uh, he, he did a few a few Ernie Stubb songs. He actually did a couple of Jimmy Rogers songs. And then he did I Love You a Thousand Ways, <clears throat> was was one of the first one of the first songs that Lefty had written. Um, and then he and then Jim Beck said, oh, man, he said, this is great. He said, this is great. He said, but do you have anything up tempo? He said, he said, first, he said, do you have any originals? And they said, oh, yeah. He said, I've written a couple. And so he did it, Love You a Thousand Ways. Because um, he had already did an Ernest Love and a Jimmy Rogers song. And so Jim Beck said, do you have any originals? And, and Lefty said, oh, yeah, well, yeah. So he did I Love You a Thousand Ways, which is a slow ballad. And one of the greatest was one of the greatest songs I ever heard, and was still probably in my in my lifetime one of the best top five songs that I've ever heard in my life was "I Love You a Thousand Ways." I love that song. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Jim Beck actually had everything up tempo. And said, "Well, I said I've been working on this idea," and he said, "Hey, boys, to grab a D." And he said, "If you got the money, honey, I got the time." Anyway. Uh, Jim Beck said, that's it. That's the one. That is the one. And, and Lefty said, well, it's not written. He said, well, write it. <laughs> write it. So Lefty put the get so walked away. He said, I'll have another few minutes. So he walked into the studio and around there. They came back in a little while. The song was written. And they, they put the song down on that little session. And uh, Jim Beck took I Love You a Thousand Ways, took... Um, if he got the money, and came all the way to Nashville with him. And he talked Lefty out of half riders on him. He said, I, I got to have at least half riders to be able to go through all the trouble of, of going to Nashville and, and pitching these songs for you. So I got to have at least half. So Lefty said, you know, have something better than an old one, you know, in that old saying. And uh, so he, he let uh, Jim Beck have half of the song. And uh, Jim Beck came to Nashville, and of course that's all in the book too about how that came down. Where he got, he brought him to play for little Jimmy Dickens, who was hot at the time. He brought, especially if you got the at the time, he really wanted little Jimmy Dickens to hear that song because Jimmy was doing those kind, of, kind of funny, uh, yeah, the novelty, novelty novel songs, yeah, that song. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, so he brought him to Nashville, and with Don Law, who was trying to find songs for little Jimmy Dickens. Anyway, later on, after all this started going, and and Jim and uh, Don Law said, well, "I want to, I want to meet the guy who actually wrote because I love his singing." So he came and met Lefty and signed with Columbia Records. So Lefty had his first hits, was "I Love You a Thousand Ways," and "If You Got the Money, I Got the Time." "If You Got the Money, I Got the Time" was Lefty's first number one song with Columbia Records in 1950. The second number one song he had was "I Love You a Thousand Ways." Uh, those two particular songs. And anyway, uh, 
later on, as the, as they started booking and, and doing tours and stuff, uh, Jim Beck was taking 50% of everything Lefty made. Everything Lefty did was 50%. And Lefty eventually started feeling like, here's Jim Beck sitting in, in a, driving the Cadillac that he bought, sitting in the house that Lefty bought, and he figured that that was too much. It should have been a, a little better deal than that. So he ran into, he worked in Beaumont, Texas, for a fellow named Jack Starnes. His wife, Neva, Neva Starnes, owned a nightclub in Beaumont, Texas. So Lefty was booked there, and he met Jack Starnes. Jack said, I can make you a better deal. I can, I can treat you better. I can get you better bookings. I can do a lot more for you. And that's how Jack came into Lefty's life. Ended up, Jack did all of that same kind of stuff. All he was in it for was for the money, and uh, and uh, Lefty eventually got to where he didn't trust anybody at all, you know. And so he never, once he got away from Jack Stones after a big lawsuit, uh, he finally got away from Jack Stones. He moved out of Beaumont, Texas, moved out to California, and uh, uh, during during that time, 1953, 1954. 1951, he had a bunch of, he had Always Late and Mom and Dad Walsh were the two big songs of that year. <clears throat> and uh, so he moved out to California, but he never trusted anybody else in the management position of his career. Too bad if he'd have got somebody uh, that was a, a real manager and was managing for the right reasons. I would have loved to see him let you have that kind of representation. Yeah, it happened Lefty a lot. never trusted anybody else. It happened a lot back in those days, unfortunately. Tell me about Steve Stebbins. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry? Tell me about Steve Stebbins. Steve Stebbins was, uh, was a booking agent at Americana uh, Promotions and Productions in California. And uh, he was a booking agent. And uh, Lefty, if anybody, if he had trusted anybody, uh, Steve would have been it. Uh, if he, as far as a, somebody he trusted that he was going to say he was going to do something nice to do it, you know, and not rip you off while he was doing it, um, Steve would have been probably that guy. But uh, Steve ended up being a booking agent uh, for Lefty and, and a lot of the other acts around uh, California at that time. You know, Town Hall Party was a, a, a TV show out of California in those days. And Lefty was, uh, and Freddie Hart, who Lefty helped, uh, as you've already you've already talked to Freddie, so you know that that Lefty was a big uh, uh, one of the first people to help Freddie Hart in in those days, oh, yeah. and brought Freddie out to California and so forth. Uh, but they were both uh, regular members of the town hall party, and uh, and Steve Stevens when he booked all that, and he booked all those people that were on the town hall party, and, uh, and so he was the big booking agent. Out of, out of California. We were talking uh, about, uh, you know, Lefty's big hits and everything, and, and he accomplished something that was, uh, I don't think it was done, had been done before and it's not been done since. Um, he had four songs in the top ten Billboard charts at the same time. And right. if I'm not mistaken, it was always late, Mom and Dad's Waltz, I Want to Be With You Always, and Traveling Blues. Exactly. Number one, number two, number four, number six, I believe. And if you'll look even further, you'll notice that uh, Hank Williams had three Wow. At that same time. Well, I guess... So that, Lefty and Hank covered the top ten. I guess that line that Haggard wrote, uh, Hank and Lefty crowded every jukebox. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the reasons why I tried to get that song from Merle. That's the way it was in 51. I said, Merle, i got to have that song. <laughs> I got to add Hank and Lefty. Crowded every jukebox. That's what it was in 51. Man, Man I love that song. Now you uh, you produced an album that was uh, put out after Lefty passed away. It was called the Legendary yeah. Lefty Frizzell, and uh, yeah. you went in and actually you put new instrumentation around him. Is that right? Yeah, I did. When I got to Nashville in '81, Scott, uh, everything I would hear on Lefty would would either be not right or or uh, or it was told by somebody else's point of view that real happiness, and I was just going around upset all the time. <laughs> you know, I mean. I got to the National in 1981 with You're the Reason God Made Oklahoma at Brawl Town. And, uh, and, uh, but boy, I tell you what, I, I was still listening to Lefty. I was, everything was Lefty. And everything I heard about him was not right or incorrect in some way. And finally, <clears throat> my wife, Joe, said, Well, you know, he said, uh, 
So that's how, when I got into writing the book. But before that, <clears throat> I went to uh, the uh, the the CEO. I went to uh, Columbia Records, and uh, and I, I I told the guy in charge. I told him that um, I said, you know, the only thing. And well, Lefty was here for 22, 25 years with Columbia Records from the very beginning uh, up to almost the end of Lefty's life. He was with Columbia Records. I said, and the only thing that dates Lefty is those tracks you guys made. I said, uh, if you if you take Lefty's voice off of those tracks and put them on brand new tracks, you realize that he's just as current a uh, singer, vocalist, as anybody is today. And the guy, and he said, uh, really? And I said, yeah. So my idea is to take and do a new album on Lefty by building some new tracks and, and taking his voice off the old tracks and put them on the new ones and make some new ones. He said, well, let's do it. I couldn't believe it. He said, let's do that. <laughs> so he gave me a, a, a little budget, and uh, and I brought in some of the great players. Oh, my gosh, great players. Now, that's just probably 82, maybe. 80, 82, I guess, probably when I did this. And I picked, uh, I, I, I kind of made a mistake now in hindsight. I wish I'd have went and took all the big hit songs and still and still kept the signature licks, like Always Late, you know, And uh, but just built the tracks around uh, brand new, you know, uh, uh, today or that day, 81, 82, and then put the signature licks back on there as well. And then just redo the, the tracks and then, put his voice back on top of them, and then put new background voices on them. And that's what me and Shelly West did. Me and Shelly was, was on a lot of those background voices. And I and in those days, let me tell you, uh, Scott, that uh, when they recorded some of those early tracks, like they, they was on one or two tracks. They only used one or two to put them all, everybody on one or two tracks. So if, these, if the background singer made a mistake or or uh, a guitar player made a mistake, they wouldn't necessarily go back and redo it. Right. Sometimes they just leave them, you know? And my ear would pick up those bad notes every time. I just couldn't stand it. <laughs> and uh, because you don't have to do that, you know, especially nowadays. Yeah. And we can go back in and just replace it, even a little bit of a note, even a half a note if we want to. Uh, so... I went in and brought the greatest players that I knew, and I knew everybody uh, in town here, and we brought in the great players. And uh, and then when when there was a time when, let me just give you an idea, when there was a time when the background singers would go off the off key, off pitch, and they did it a lot, uh, a fellow named Abe Mulkey was one of the people that sang harmony with a one part harmony behind lefty, the second, in other words, uh, harmony to the lefty. And sometimes he'd get off a little bit off pitch. Nowadays, we just tune that voice, right? Yeah. In those days, it would be too much trouble to have him redo it. <laughs> so they just leave it and just kill me every time I hear it. <laughs> and uh, so if I had to take the background voice off, I had to take lefty's voice off, uh -huh. right? I'd lose them both. Or whatever was on that one track I had to... If I wanted to replace, if it was bad, I'd lose everything on that track. So uh, when it comes time to do that, I'd say, well, then I have to figure out uh, what I can do about it. And in those days, we st in 81, we still didn't have uh, tuning uh, machines like we do today. Yeah, yeah. You know, now I can tune anything. I can tune an engine out there with it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but we got, I got them all over the house. But, uh, but uh, otherwise, I might have been able to just tune the background scene. But we had to take them off, and what we did, we took Lefty's voice off. Well, my brother Alan, this, I'm, this is the first time I've ever told anybody this, so your show is going to be the first to ever hear about this. All right. Was that I would bring brother Alan in to imitate Lefty. Is that right? Uh, and, I, and he was so good at it. Man, Alan was, and the only other person that could have done it would have been Merle. But I, but I had Alan with me, so Alan, I had him going, and he'd replace the line, or maybe two or three words, or whatever it was, or maybe maybe the chorus, you know, whatever. And that's how it was done. Matter of fact, I have to tell you this to go with that, was that later on I played that album for 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 my friend Merle, and even he didn't know it. 
Oh, and I never told. And I never told. <laughs> I didn't know that. I I would have never guessed that either. Wow, that's cool. I, I bet you Alan didn't even tell you that when you thought. No, he didn't. That. That's, but that's pretty the cool. First time it's been told. So your show's gonna be the first first one they ever heard. Well, all right, we got an exclusive on my kind of country. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but Alan was so good, bless his heart. I wouldn't have done it if he couldn't have done it. You know, I mean, I I'd have to think of something else. But that's well, I'll tell you one of, one of the things that I've got on my slate for this year is to do a tribute to the great Lefty Frizzell. And uh, almost everybody that I know wants to be a part of it. Um, and uh, so if I do it, uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to go in and do an updated version of like me doing a lefty song or uh, or a Jimmy Fortune singing a, uh, uh, a lefty song. And, and then we'll have lefty on something, you know. So a tribute to lefty by everybody that admired Lefty Frizzell, and oh, everybody wants to be a part of it. That's so that's fantastic. one of the things I want to do this year. Well, you be sure to let me know, and we'll do a feature on it on the show, you bet. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Scott, because there's a couple, two or three songs that I want to put on there that I wrote about Lefty. Right after he passed away um, in 75, July 19, 1975, uh, I, not too long after that, I started writing some songs about Lefty. One was We Won't Be Here and Always Late Anymore oh, was yeah. one of them. I want to yeah. redo that one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just some songs that, that dedicate to Lefty and then and then put all these other songs of Lefty's on there, you know. We'll have to get uh, Freddie to record that song that he wrote then for that. That'd be and great. Freddie needs to do that song yeah. and yeah. put that on there. He needs to go on that tribute album. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up. Well, yeah. Keep, keep me posted <laughs> because we'll... Uh, Keep me posted because we'll definitely, uh, you know, we'll do a big feature on the show. I'm excited about that. Well, after I wrote the Lefty book, the the memoir of my brother Lefty, of my thoughts and 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 everything that I remembered about uh, about the great Lefty, uh, I wrote that book from Lefty's point of view. I want everybody to know that I wrote whether it was right, wrong, or indifferent it didn't matter to me. It was if Lefty thought it was this way. If Lefty made it happen that way, if Lefty believed it was this way, that's the way the book was written. Yeah, was from Lefty's point of view, and uh, and that's how I wrote that that whole that whole book. If he thought it, he thought it was this way. It was like this. That's how the book was written. And uh, matter of fact, uh, the book uh, ended up being uh, the CMA or CMT's book of the year uh, when it came out a couple of years ago. And uh, but if you ever really want to know who, who, what Lefty was like, uh, if you want to know the insights of, of how it happened, how a kid from rags to riches—this was a true rags to riches—how uh, that happened, how he made it happen, how he dealt with it when 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 it when he did make it happen—I think it's important to know, Scott, that it's really important for for you to know. That Lefty had four songs in the top ten at one time. Right? Never been done. Yep. But isn't it even better to know how he felt about having four songs in the top ten at the same time? You know, to me, that's what's important. Absolutely. And uh, and so that's how that book was written. So after I wrote the book, I did the the audio book on it so that you could actually hear Lefty. And I and I read the book. I read the book uh, on on uh, on on for, for CDs. And there's eight CDs in that in that uh, in that uh, in that product, um, and you actually hear it's, you actually hear Lefty sing the song. You actually hear Lefty sing a little bit of "Always Late" or "Mom and Dad Waltz" or "You Got the Money, Got the Time," or just you know you get to hear it. I use those songs to segue from one chapter to another, and uh, and you actually hear Lefty singing. Now that's important to me because it's a book about a. A singer songwriter. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to hear him sing, you Amen. know? Amen. So that was the next idea. And so I did that. I wrote the book, did the audio portion of it so you could actually hear this man. And um, and I like the fact that, that you could hear him talk. He he didn't talk like anybody else. He changed the English language around. <laughs> Lady, there's a there's a piece in that audio book, if you haven't heard it, you gotta listen to it because it is an interview with Bill Mack, uh, the radio station out of Fort Worth, big, big, big old famer, Bill Mack, great friend of the family. And Merle Haggard, he had Bill Mack, had Merle Haggard interviewing Merle in Fort Worth, 
and they called Lefty and got him on the phone. And it's the three of them, and it's the most amazing thing. I put the whole thing oh, on audio great. books. That's great. So if you haven't it. heard that, you need to look it up. It's in there. I got to get that. And right. you hear a lefty talk and hear him laughing and hear him how he would turn <laughs> the English language around. And, oh, it's just amazing, uh, especially especially having Merle ask lefty questions. <laughs> it's just amazing. <laughs> you got to hear it. It's, a, it's well worth your time to go back and do it. But anyway, after I did those things, I stopped and I thought, what else can I do? My God. What else can I do that I can do? And uh, so I decided, uh, I had a I had a guy, I contacted some people, a guy out of Hollywood, a screenplay writer, and uh, and I and I uh, hired him to write a screenplay. Well, he wrote a screenplay, and uh, and and I didn't really like it so much, and uh, so I decided, well, I'm just going to do it myself. So that's when I started writing screenplays. I wrote, uh, I've written five different ways of listening to the lefty story now. Wow. Told by different ways that you could tell the same story because it, it's his life. So it's, it has to be his life. So, uh, so you, so, but there's, there's different ways you can, you can tell about a subject, you know. And so I told it a lot of different ways. The last one I told, I wrote was, uh, for me, me and Merle, who, we really want to do this thing together. Merle was so excited about being involved with the Lefty Frizzell project. And that is the Lefty Frizzell possible movie, the Lefty Frizzell uh, soundtrack, uh, and also doing the soundtrack for the movie. He was going to help me do it. We were all involved with doing it. And uh, uh, and then actually this last year, uh, October, November, I was going to get with him and we was going to start the the the, the uh, soundtrack for the movie. And we'd already then we'd already have one, right? Yeah. Uh, and we were just going to pay for that ourselves. We're just we were just going to do it ourselves. And we were going to do it at his place out in California because he's got this incredible, absolutely incredible um, uh, studio out there. Yeah. Anyway, uh, then then he had to leave us, you know, and that changed everything uh, when Merle had to go. And it just broke my heart and everybody else's. Me too. And uh, so now I still got to do it. Uh, but uh, so I so I thought, but I wrote the screenplay around me and Merle telling the story of Left. Mm -hmm. So me and Merle would be in the movie oh. as storytellers. Oh, right? wow. So that's how the last screenplay was written: was me and Merle telling this, telling different parts of Lefty's life. That's cool. And that's how it was written. That's cool. Then there's a special song. I don't know if you've got it, Scott, that uh, I wrote and put on some album some time back. It's called Goodbye. I sure do. Remember the song? I love it. You well, bet. I want to put that in the movie. I want to put that. And the last scene I, I wrote for the new screenplay was me and Merle was going to be in, uh, in uh, San Antonio. Uh, doing a concert, and we were going to have, I was going to sing that song in the concert, and I was going to have Merle walk out and sing the chorus with me. Oh, wow. Uh, for the end of the movie. Can you imagine that? Man. Do you remember that song? Now, if you haven't got it, I'll make sure you got oh, it. I love it. I love uh, it. I have it. I love it's it. It's actually, that first part of the song is about Lefty. The second part is about Mama. Yeah. Those are most two important people in my life was Lefty and my mama. And, uh, and so I wrote the song because I never got a chance to say goodbye to either one of them before they passed. And it always bugged me, always broke my heart every time I think about it. So finally, I just had to write a song about it. So if you've got the song, I hope you'll get a chance to listen to it. Well, we'll, we'll, play, but, it at uh, the, we'll play that at the end that, of the interview here. Oh, okay. Yeah, but so anyway, that, <clears throat> so that's, that's the live screenplay that was sent out to California. And that's the one that, uh, that, uh, my friend, my people, are, uh, people's coming in from California talking to me about the movie, possible movie. This month they're coming in, uh, flying in from that, from out from California to talk to me about a possible movie. That's all I said at this moment because that's that's where I'm at right now. Well, you keep us posted, and uh, we're I will, Scott. Love. Sounds I will, like you got a lot of great I, things. I want to thank you before I get off here. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, I don't think Leslie ever got the credit due. Uh, and if there's anything I can do about it, I'm going to do it. And if I, I really want to put this, I want to put the tribute album together 
with a lot of my friends that that were uh, that knew lefties. There's still some people here that knew lefty. We just lost Jean Shepard a while back, and she was one of lefty's favorite female singers, and uh, and actually one of mine too. But really, really went in his end from his time. But uh, we lost her this past year as well. Thank you so much, David, for being on this uh, very special show for My Kind of Country, our tribute to Lefty Frizzell. And we're going to play goodbye right now. And, folks, I want you to listen very carefully to this. And also visit davidfrizzell.com because the book and the CDs are available there and all of David's music, of course. And uh, and we'll look forward to hearing lots more about the tribute album and the, and the movie, David. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. See you, Scott. Bye-bye, buddy. <laughs> 